Hey guys, how we doing? Black and White Christianity coming at you again. So glad you're with us tonight. Very, very excited. We're starting a new series called Now You Know. Uh, and we're just so happy to be blessed with uh, Scott Cayley again, coming back to be on the show. We had such a good time with you last time. Scott, thanks for being here with us. Yeah, good to be back. Thanks for the inv invite. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Appreciate you being here. And uh, we're, we're glad that we were able to have you be the first pastor, hopefully in a line of pastors, to come on for this series of Now You Know. And let me just lightly explain for the listeners of what we're doing here. The purpose of this series really is is so often people are looking for a church and they're going into a church hoping to get a lot of answers in the one Sunday. And a lot of times you don't get those answers in one Sunday. And so the whole purpose of, of us doing, Tyreek and I doing this series, is hopefully to give people an overarching idea of what a church and leadership views on topics that the majority of you are really looking for and really trying to get answered. And so we're hoping to take maybe some of that legwork out um, for when you're getting into the church. Uh, or trying to get into a church. Hopefully you are getting into a church. So uh, with that being said, <clears throat> we're going to ask uh, Pastor Scott here uh, a myriad of questions. And hopefully some of these questions are the questions that you would want answered as you're looking for a church home and a congregation to get involved in. Um, and so let's just jump right in. So Scott, just off the top, do you believe all scripture is God breathed? Yes. Um, you know, it would be the, it'd be the position of our church. It would be the position that, that I would uphold that, um, all scripture is, is God breathed useful for teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness so that the man of God or the woman of God, the people of God might be fully equipped for every good work. So, um, we know that the scripture, the new, you know, it's, it says of the scriptures that it was, they wrote as they were carried along by the spirit. Um, and so, yeah, we believe that uh, in the same way that God breathed life into Adam, um, he, bro he breathed life into the world, word, so it's living and active. Um, it's um, it's uh, obviously there are some faith decisions in its canonicity and 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 um, meaning that you know we understand that that the Spirit carried them along as it was written, but of course. Um, it wasn't dictated um, to them. Therefore, you know, scriptures are written by, you know, uh, in terms of audience, in terms of context, in terms of even right. in some instances, personality and viewpoint. Um, you know, you see that in the Gospels and other things, you know, um, you know, so um, but but we also have to make those faith decisions that in its canonicity and the formation of canon, um, you know, that some of the early church fathers had different uh, lists of books that that they believed them to be inspired and stuff. And so um, in its original context, in its original language, all scripture is God breathed. Yeah. Now, that doesn't mean that every translation is God breathed, um, mm. um, but in its original text and its original content, that all scripture is God breathed. So um, but it's also we know that God is not a God of confusion. So we trust that. Um, that God has also been involved in formation of canon and, and other things. So, okay. um, but that is a faith decision, you know? So okay. good, good. I think you explained that quite well, your stance on that. I don't think I really need a follow-up question on any of that. Um, let's just go on to the next one then. <clears throat> We've got about 10 here. Uh, what is your stance or the church's stance on homosexuality and gay marriage? Um, well, I'll, 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 I'll go straight for it. And then okay. we'll, we'll we'll talk that out a little bit. So, okay. um, homosexuality uh, is, um, is is sin. Um, First Corinthians six tells us that. Um, but uh, you know that neither the homosexual offender nor the male prostitute shall inherit the kingdom of heaven. Um, and so it stands in opposition of God's design for sexuality, and uh, thereby, you know, gay marriage would also. Um, stand in opposition of God's design uh, for, for marriage between one woman and one man. Um, that was what God called very good. Um, right. And Jesus comes <clears throat> affirms that from the very, very beginning, uh, which I know later on you're going to ask the question of divorce, and we'll get in more into that. Um, but I do believe that, that all sin— homosexuality, uh, you know, whether all, especially sexual sin, uh, porneia, 
is the is the Greek word for right. uh, for sexual immorality. That all of that is a matter of first love. All sin is a matter of first love. It's sin is a self love issue, right? And um, you know God's first <laughs> first and foremost law is not to have any other gods before me. And there's nothing probably more self indulgent, um, in my opinion, than sexual sin. And uh, so homosexuality would mm-hmm. fall under that, you know, that uh, forsaking the eternal for the purpose so, of indulging the flesh. Yeah. I don't mean to cut you off, but just real quick, I wanted to ask this before we sure. let you continue on. So the church that you are a leader over would not then engage in uh, a ceremony for a gay wedding. No, no. Okay. As a matter of fact, we had a circumstance at one of our uh, recent, we call it Discover Cornerstone dinners, and we were asked whether we would recognize um, the marriage of a transgender couple. Um, we didn't exactly know what recognition meant, affirm, right. celebrate, or whatever. I didn't know, you know, that's sort of an ambiguous word. Um, and uh, once we had our explanation, you know, of what recognition meant as far as like, would we engage in the ceremony or perform the ceremony of our, our no was that, that, that couple hasn't been back. So that would be, that would be the stance of both Cornerstone, you know, okay. and myself. yeah. Okay, good. So <laughs> um, moving along here, uh, there's so many, there's so many thoughts on this. Uh, people talk about, um, you know, eternal punishment uh, some people say hell is right here on earth. People are experiencing hell on earth. Uh, do you believe that hell, the place that is spoken of in the Bible is a real place? Absolutely. Um, that hell, hell is the, uh, uh, you know, right now, um, I don't know how far, uh, you need me to go into this, but you know, um, we can always so, circle back. We can always circle back if we've got okay. time and you want to dive a little deeper. So yeah, absolutely, as we can far do as, as, as far as w- what hell and heaven is right now are both intermediate states. You know, um, heaven, heaven for the believers is not in its eternal state. You know, in Revelation, John says, behold, I saw a new heaven and new earth. I saw a new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. Um, I could get more into that, that aspect of it. Um, you know, and and then um, that eternal lake of fire um, uh, that that is prepared for for the devil and his angels, and and where Jesus condemns the goats. You know, in Matthew twenty five, um, there's the um, um, so so yeah. I mean, we know that this. You know, and I guess my cues my cues for hell um, I, I take from Jesus in Luke chapter. Um, 16 with the the story of the rich man and Lazarus, you know, and we know that hell is a place of torment, that hell is possibly a place where those present, um, and at least in its intermediate state, where those present in there can somehow see, you know, what is going on, because the rich man recognizes Lazarus, he's able to look across and call upon Abraham, he's calling upon, you know, so maybe there's some, um, uh, uh, awareness of that, which would be a whole other kind of torment, you know. Yeah, um, no doubt. But he- hell is a real place. With <laughs> real that's how that's the word that is used when Jesus is telling the story. It is torment. It is thirst. It is you know a, a, probably a spiritual thirst uh, along with a physical thirst. Um, it's spiritual pain. It's psychological pain without any hope of relief. And um, you know that is a real. Uh, real place. Hell cannot be on earth because God is still influencing, you know? Um, and so there there's, and that's the, that's the, that's the ultimate reality of hell, right? Is that it's absent of God. There, so you, you would, know. then you would reject the doctrine of obliteration then. Uh, of annihilation. Yeah. I yeah, would reject that, 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 okay. that eventually we come to nothing. No, I believe yeah, we're just obliterated essentially. Uh, Right now, right now, I believe that hell is in an intermediate state, but there is an eternal state of I hell that will be realized, you know, uh, upon the second coming and where <laughs> Jesus puts an end to um, to all of that. So good. Very good. Very good uh, explanations. So there, there's a difference between hell and the lake of fire, correct? Um, 
Yes. Yeah. I mean, there's a, uh, as far as like in the, uh, the, the, the intermediate state hell is not that, it's not that lake of fire. That would be the eternal state of hell as I would understand it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. What, yeah. what, what, what is required for salvation? Um, you know, I'll, I'll take all my cues mostly not, I shouldn't say all, I will take most of my cues for salvation from the book of Acts, you know, and I can't think of a better place to go than in Acts chapter eight, you know, when, uh, Philip is in Samaria and, uh, he, he is called to the Ethiopian eunuch, right. And, um, uh, Ethiopian eunuch is reading a passage from Isaiah. Philip asks, do you understand what you're reading? How can I, unless someone teaches me? And it says in Acts that, that, uh, uh, he Acts 835, he started with that very verse and taught him the good news about it. <coughs> and so um, I think you see a couple of things just in that passage. Um, he told him the good news and we can infer infer um, from that passage because there's other passages that he put his faith in God through that spoken message. Um, he repented of his sins because in Acts chapter two, you know, on the day of Pentecost, we see um, Peter preaching that message with the culminating statement, this Jesus whom you crucified is both now Lord and Christ. It says that they were cut to the heart. Brothers, what shall we do? Repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sin. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, right? And so in Acts chapter 8, verse 35, he told him the good news. We can assume that Philip, Philip repeated that same message as, uh, as Peter and related to the gospel, Acts 8, 36, well, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized, right? And uh, so, um, uh, and, and you see that it all played out throughout all of the book of Acts, faith, repentance, and baptism. So, yeah. So you would say, just to be clear, what is required for salvation is faith. Is, so it's repentance, faith, and baptism. Yep. I mean, without faith, Hebrews eleven six. without faith, it's impossible to please God, right? Right. So the, the, the fact that, so this is a division. I grew up Baptist and Baptists uh-huh. do not believe that baptism is a necessity for salvation. And so this is so important to make sure uh, I get right with, with when we're asking, I, like you said, baptism is essential for salvation. And mm-hmm. I, I fully agree with you on that. And so, um, so like you said, faith, repentance, and baptism. Uh, good. Very good uh, on that uh, explanation. Um, and, so the next question here is, what is your view and the church's view on divorce? Well, you know, before we get into um, a little more of a complicated view, right? So we have, <laughs> we have Jesus's, he, Jesus' two statements, and I'll just take, you know, from Matthew, um, in Matthew chapter uh, 5, and then in Matthew chapter 19, you know, um, in Matthew, in both cases, Jesus is addressing an, an issue with the Pharisees. Um, there was the teaching of Rabbi Shammai, and there was a teaching of Rabbi Halal. Right. You yeah. know, Rabbi Halal would allow for for divorce for any reason, right? If you if your wife burnt the toast, divorce her. If you got, <laughs> I've heard that same exact example. Divorce her. Yeah. <laughs> That's Rabbi Halal because it basically he, they Rabbi Halal interpreted the the you know the the passage in Deuteronomy as for any reason just as long as you give them a certificate of divorce Rabbi Shammai was on the spectrum of there is no other reason uh, for um, divorce except for um, adultery or mar- marital unfaithfulness right um, so the church's position would would be we should do everything we can to uphold the, our our um, our marriage. We should do everything we can to uphold um, what God has in, in its initial state with Adam and Eve called very good, you know. And I think this is a compassionate command because, you know, God hates divorce because God just hates divorce. No, God hates divorce because of what it does to people, you know, and, and, and the, the collateral damage of, of divorce. Um, and so Cornerstone would hold that we should do everything, everything um, to uphold the sanctity of, of, of marriage. But 
you know, and I'm going to insert my personal view here and, and my personal view, divorce is a result of sin. Um, you know, I know that there would be some tribes that would, that would hold that divorce is a sin. Divorce is a sin itself, but I think divorce in itself can be a result of sin because of amalgam of reasons that we, um, Again, it comes down to first love. If I love God first and foremost, I live sacrificially. Um, I live, you know, as a husband, I love my wife as Christ loved the church. As a wife, I respect my husband. I respond in that responder, that pursuer, responder role. Um, but obviously, because we are fallen people, we are fallen people and we sin. Sometimes the collateral effects of those sin is that, you know, we divorce. And I think the problem, the hang up then becomes, OK, if you divorce, can you get remarried? And, um, you know, and I I would view, um, you know, and I think Cornerstone would agree uh, as far as an eldership and a leadership that divorce is not the impardonable or unforgivable sin. You know, that it falls under First John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just forgive us our sins, purify us. It's not. You know, it's it's not the grieving of the Holy Spirit. It's not, you know, something that it would be unpardonable. Um, but of course, we would not. We, we would certainly do everything we can. And I have, through my 30 years of marriage, done absolutely everything to help people um, to uphold, to move towards forgiveness, to move towards, um, you know, there's two questions that I ask people when they come to me for marriage counseling. First of all, do you want this to work? And second of all, what sacrifices are you going to make? Oh, to make real work? quick, real sure. quick. Um, is there, so would you say that there are circumstances that the Bible or your, the church in your view uh, would give for divorce? That would be um, uh, outside of adultery. Uh, sure. Outside of like the main one that everybody knows, you know, your wife or husband sure. cheated. And so therefore I have this, this freedom to do this now. Uh, is sure. there any other uh, situations that you would say oh, that I, would, I think... uh, you know, I, I, I think you would, uh, it's one of those things that would be obvious would fall under like abuse, you know, okay. there would be mental abuse, um, uh, physical abuse, okay. um, uh, sexual abuse, um, and, in those kind of ways that, you know, can I prove those things by scripture? Um, but I think all of us would agree that, you know, th th those are unhealthy circumstances, right? Would you say that the situation that Paul describes where one is a believer and one is not to let the other one leave, if they so want to leave, would you say that is a clear, uh, sure, reason sure. that's that? clear. That's clear from scripture and, and first okay. Corinthians seven there. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if the unbeliever would leave, let them leave. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we're going to continue on. Uh, and like I said, if we, if we get to the end of these and we have more time, if there's any ones that you want to elaborate on more, you're by all means, you can do that. Uh, but what would you say uh, in the church's stance on the role of women in leadership in the church? Yeah, um, we, we've recently had this discussion and certainly Cornerstone would hold to a complementary, not an egalitarian position, meaning that, um, you, you know, women could hold uh, roles of, of, of teaching. Um, but basically, I guess I could say in short, the roles that would be exclusive or, or excluded from from uh, women would be the role of elder and and the role of um, whether you want to call it uh, evangelist, you know, um, shepherd, um, preacher, minister. Um, they would be excluded from those roles um, because the scripture, you know, as elder, they say the elder should be a husband of one wife, um, you, you know, and and. That, that role of evangelist, we don't see that role being played out um, in, um, in the church from, from, from a woman. So would, yeah. they, would they permit a woman to, uh, you said you would permit a woman to teach. Uh, would you permit a woman to teach if there were same uh, age grouped men in the audience they were teaching? Um, well, this gets into that, that position of soft complementarism, you know, and, and I, I think because we have the, 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 the daughters of Philip who were prophets, um, whether they, you know, we see that Anna was a prophetess in the temple. Um, I, I think it would be hard. You know, I know that Paul says, as for me, and allow women to teach or hold authority. 
uh, over men. I think the I think the important part of that that is often I think sometimes um, what gets exalted is that word teach, and and we miss out on that word authority, which. If a woman is teaching under the authority of the elders, if the woman is teaching under the authority of the elders, has she usurped that the authority as of, of men? Well, I, you could really you could you could really make that case for pastor though, because she would essentially be under the elders in that role, wouldn't she not? If she was in that role. But I think I think that what what we have is this we don't have any indication of a female assuming the role of an evangelist or of a, as a minister. There's sure. no, where at the same time, there could be precedents such as Priscilla, again, as the daughters of Philip, yeah. that where they were in some capacity as teaching, right? We, when it comes to Apollos, you know, it says of Aquila and Priscilla that they, they, it uses a plural pronoun. They taught him the way of God more accurately. Um, so, so in that way, Priscilla was in some kind of teaching position, um, um, in, in directly with Apollos. You could say, well, did Aquila do all of the talking? Did Aquila do all? Of, <clears throat> is that discipleship over teaching in a classroom? That's where I say things can get. Um, so, I, I do not believe that a woman should ever have the role of elder, therefore usurping, you know that. And I found this to be true. You know, I've. Um, in my own household, my wife is is in a position of authority in the workplace, um, but she submits to my spiritual leadership in the home. She does not want to usurp that. And I think most godly women who who um, are led by the spirit of God, they don't want to usurp that. Matter of fact, they long for spiritual leadership um, in their home. Um, sure. But I think there are very gifted teachers. I think very, very gifted, um, you know, there are some some women who um, um, oh shoot why can't I think of her name? There was a woman theologian that wrote a book on the resurrection that was excellent. You know I think there are um, there there can have the capacity of of teaching. So um, we would hold to a position to state it more succinctly. Cornerstone would hold to a position if you wanted to put it in a neat little box of soft complementarism, but we are not egalitarian. Um, in that way that women would assume the role of minister. So, or yeah. Okay. So that was going to be my final question for that. Yeah. You cornerstone would not affirm a woman pastor. No. Okay. We'll just, we'll, we'll move on from that. I'm sure we can kind of, that would be one of those we could kind of really dig after for a while. We're just going to keep it moving. So go ahead. All right. yep. What's your membership process? Um, our membership process that anyone who is immersed at cornerstone is, is becomes a member of, of cornerstone or if they have been immersed in another church, um, um, then, then they simply restate their confession of faith uh, before the congregation, and then they are brought on as, as a member of Cornerstone. Well, immersion what? is... Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was literally going to ask the same. What is immersion? Like, what is that? What is immersed? It's baptized, you know, fully immersed, fully baptized, and in, in water and raised to walk in a new life. So, um, yeah. May, may I ask you a question? Sure. So, so, all right. So like, let's say I come to your church, right. And I say, Oh yeah, man, I've been baptized or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. But like, um, do you, do you feel, do you feel the need to be like, well, you know, I would like to have you baptized here. Like, or, or you don't feel no. that need to do that. No, no, no. Um, now, if it, if a if a member was coming from um, a place where they had been sprinkled or poured yeah, upon, that was my next. Um, yeah. You know, we were because even within, you know, I'll just take this from a procedural standpoint. You know, um, because we're talking about membership, which is procedural, even within our bylaws and within our voting guidelines, it says that members are in immersed believer um uh so so if they wanted to to be a member outside of you know i could get into baptizo and all of that kind of thing but just from a procedural standpoint you could not be a member of cornerstone without being an immersed believer what 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 kind of what kind of um 
what kind of benefits is there? Not to say that you're trying to get anything from the church or anything like that, but I've all, I've always been curious as to the benefits of being a member of a church as opposed to attending a church. Okay. Well, I, you're kind of scratching my itch, Tyreek. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I am far less interested in membership than I am. You know, I don't want to get all into this, but um, in short, I, this could be a whole other podcast. Um, we'll have believe, you back for something of that. So don't worry. Yeah, we'll get, we'll, we'll have you I on believe, call. I believe in Ephesians when Paul talks about the principalities of darkness, I think those are fallen yet redeemable things. And I think institutions can be fallen and redeemable things. And I think sometimes the church, when it gets more concerned with its own survival, opens itself up to the demonic. And, and I think church membership can become one of those things. All right. And so I, I don't emphasize if people come to me and say, hey, we want to place our membership with our church, of course, I'm not going to say, you know, membership is unnecessary. You know, you're part of the kingdom of heaven, you know, um, because I think people there. There are people who I think a place to belong and a place to engage and a covenantal understanding of that. I think that is is important. But but man, we're kingdom dwellers. And I want to make sure that I'm about building kingdom, not empire. And so I think we have to be cautious sometimes with membership and that kind of thing. So, so that's a whole other podcast. We could talk about, you know, the crisis of leadership in the church and how the church has been more concerned with empire than kingdom and church membership can fall under that. Um, but so, yeah. Um, yeah, dude, that's, you're scratching my itch. I'm, I don't put a whole lot of, I don't put a whole lot of, you know, you, you need to be a member. Matter of fact, you know, people that attend Cornerstone know that at the end of the service, when I give whatever you want to call it an invitation or, you know, I don't mention membership. I don't mention if you want to place your membership, you know, because I mean, if someone I just, we're kingdom dwellers, right. We're kingdom builders, um, not empire, not empire builders. So, yeah. I appreciate that answer. Well, um, <laughs> I'm about to say, I know you like that. Yeah. I appreciate that. Answer. Um, <laughs> I um I am unfortunately tasked with this question. So in advance, I'm not coming at, at the position or anything like that. No, no. But um what what would I'm you always say coming the at the position purpose. <laughs> what would you say the purpose of a pastor is? Yeah. Well I think I think you know if if I was to get into um the uh the the role itself. You know, I, I, you have to look at Ephesians 4, right? And he gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be shepherds and teachers. I think, you know, obviously, poor men, pastor falls under that, that term of shepherd. Um, and really, in, in, its perfect, in its perfect context, elders should be pastors. They're, they're located... Preachers should be evangelists, right? That was sort of in its perfect contents. The evangelist would come, he would preach. It was really the elders who remained and were, for all intents and purposes, the paid staff that, that stuck around in its perfect contents. But you take this, since we've accepted this cathedral mindset, you know, and we've put the, the pastor on the stage, you know, the roles have become... And again, this is probably a whole other podcast, but the roles have become extremely confused where, where, you know, the pastor has had to play CEO. He's had to play visionary. He's had to play Ted talk. He's had to play, you know, financier and, and contractor and all of these things, but in its essence, pastor supposed to shepherd, you know, that's the meaning of the word point men, shepherd, um, to be the spiritual mentor, um, the spiritual leader, to walk alongside people through the process of discipleship, you know, um, and, and in effect, um, that's that should be the heart. If your heart um, as as a pastor, as a minister, is it first a shepherd? Is it first a discipleship? Then you are doing a disservice. Which I think here's what's happened. And again 
how we've opened ourselves up to the demonic is we've put people in place from from the business world and on the stage and in the pulpit and and now we're leading people in 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 ways that aren't provoking um the spiritual formation you know um that should be taking place so in its essence the role of pastor is is shepherd you know um to to nurture um rebuke um cultivate and prune um the flock i am a um i am a big proponent of smaller gatherings like i've i've always been that way and uh i feel that in mega churches you become a number or you know a, a just another placeholder True. essentially how how do you feel about how, how do, like I guess my question to you would be do you think that it is possible to shepherd the way that you probably should if you were in a bigger congregation as opposed to a more intimate setting do you feel like it's easier I feel like just just the standard it would be easier but I would love to hear what you have to say about that yeah no I don't think you know, I, I'm probably going to get in big trouble for saying this. <laughs> I don't think, I don't think the term mega was ever um, in the vernacular. You know, I mean, we, we see, we see in Acts chapter two, that 3000 were added to their number that day. Right. But where were their meeting? And we learned in Acts two forty two that they met in the temple courts. That was their large group gathering. But where was the ministry going on? being done in the homes right and i'm not talking about a home group on wednesday night you know i'm talking about that's probably every night probably all the time you know one of the most um one of the most egregious sins of omission is hospitality in the church today where we're not in each other's lives enough you know so um i don't want to totally say i don't want to totally paint this broad brush and go no discipleship is being done in a church greater than four or 500. But at the same time, I think, I, I think it has to would get. You, would you say that, and I don't mean to interrupt you, but since you said what you said, I wanted to ask, you said no discipleship, you know, you don't want to say that no discipleship is being done at 400 or greater. Would you say the larger it gets, the less it happens? I would. Yeah. Okay. yeah. You know, I learned of a mega that uh, they basically have home groups that meet for four to six weeks. And, and I don't know, I don't know what on earth can be accomplished by that. You know, um, it's I, not, I, I've been a part of such groups there. You don't accomplish anything, you know, and it's like a charcuterie board, honestly. Yeah. Like if you go there and you tie it out and you're like, I don't really like this cheese. You could go to another thing. And I, and I, right. I feel like that's real, that's real sloppy because like, like go and experience the whole thing, get the understanding. Like these are still brothers and sisters in the Lord. You know, there's something there that could be you can give or it, you can take from it. And then if you want to go complete what you start, you know, like that's just how I feel about it. But that's not how we see it. They went there and like I don't really like it, and then they were gone. You know. Right. Yep. I I you you will hear me say over and over again that discipleship is a lifelong process. We walk with people for life, right? Mm -hmm. We walk with with people, you know, throughout their mess, you know, you'll hear me say how messy. And I think that's the problem is we really don't, you know, we've lost this, we've lost this capacity um, to deal with mess, you know, and Jesus, Jesus, he placed himself in the mess, right. Mm -hmm. And, and really didn't care about his reputation, you know, um, in the mess, you know, that he, he, he met with disreputable people and it, and it tells us, you know, Luke adds this little, or Mark adds this little editorial note that um, that there were many of this kind, disreputable sinners that were in the in the ones that followed Jesus. They were in the process of formation, right? And and Jesus walked with them. And I think I think sometimes we keep things too sterile, and we keep things too programmatical, and you know, and we walk with people. And I think that's the problem with getting too large is now it becomes a program and it can't be just a matter of walking with people, 
you know, glad you said it like that. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you said what you said right at the end there, because it's going to lead me into this little sublurb of that question Tyreek asked you. Do you believe that a degree should be required for somebody to pastor a flock? Do I? No. Do I think it's helpful? Yes. You know, I do think, okay. I, you know, one of the things that, you know, through my six years of study, I was I was taught by an amalgam, all, all with the same for, for our tribe, what we would call the restoration principles of, of the restoration movement, you know, the independent Christian church, church Christ, all of them with that, but all of them schooled from everybody from Cambridge in the UK to Harvard or Yale to Wheaton or whatever, you know, they brought, they brought many different kind of views from various theologians and challenged us with those things. And so I think, I think it can be, I think it can be helpful. I think study and formal study can be helpful. Is it necessary? No, no. You know, I, no, um, to pastor. Absolutely. I think my father-in-law is a prime example of a, of a man that was extremely schooled uh, in the word of God, you know? Um, and for the most part, I mean, he was carried along by some, um, some teachers, but he got in the word and he got in commentaries and he studied and, um, you know, but he had a, he had a high school, he had a GED. He didn't even have a high school diploma. Um, but the man, the man was an amazing teacher, um, simple, simple teacher uh, of the word of God, yet weighty. You know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. so I, but I do think, it, I think it is helpful. Um, I'm very grateful um, uh, because, you know, I, I got to take, um, textual criticism from Lewis Foster, who wrote the study notes for the NIV study Bible for Luke and Acts, you know, um, very learned man, yet humble man who, you know, who challenged us to affirm. Yeah. The word. Yeah. Would you say, would you say because of kind of what we've done here in America and our process of this, sometimes this just becomes a profession instead of a passion. And so like what you said earlier, um, you know, you have people that are in these roles uh, that essentially look at it as a as a nine to five. Uh, they they went to school. They viewed it as a career choice. Uh, they may not necessarily have been called by the Lord, but you know somebody said you know you didn't really get into this, so why not try this? And they've and now they've done it, and and they've they're essentially spiritually dead, and they keep their congregation dead. So do you think it's a problem we see? Oh yeah, I mean I've said this for years. You know, being a pastor, being a preacher, minister can be a really easy gig. Mm. Uh, you know, you know, and I've, and I think that, you know, and I, and I think, I think there are definitely some, but the ones that will make a difference who, you know, the ones, and by a difference, I mean that you'll see fruit in the, in the lives of, and by fruit, I mean the, you know, the, the good works that, that glorify God, you know, that, that, you know, that, that fruit, um, not just the Galatians 522, but I mean, we see, you know, we, we see them, you know, rejoicing in affliction. We see them having courage under oppression. We see them having boldness in the face of opposition. We see them loving their enemies, you know, all of that kind of so, stuff. So, so it's more than just the degree. It's oh, more than that. Okay. Yeah, all right. I mean, let's here's uh, scholarship. Scholarship has its, its place. Um, but I think, I think sometimes, you know, just like anything, when scholarship becomes about my um, exaltation, I have opened myself up to the demonic and right, a, lot of, right, right, a right. lot of harm can come from that. But there are also be, been very humble scholars um, who have done, you know, a tremendous work of making us, of challenging us, um, you know, towards a greater depth of understanding of the word of God. So, so I think we have to be cautious, um, not to broad stroke, um, everybody that's endeavored in scholarship that, you know, I think there are very, you know, there are some things to be learned, you know, like Paul, when Paul says, I rejoice if Christ is preached, you know, and, and so I think there's something to learn from the scholarship of, you know, even the egocentric, if they've opened up, you know, uh, something for me to understand the word of God um, in a deeper way, you know. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll, 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 uh, 
we'll go forward from here. That was a good explanation. We thank you for that. Let's uh, let me ask you this: How do you approach interpreting the Bible, and what principles guide your understanding of Scripture? Well, first of all, if you don't go to the Word with prayer, here's the thing, and, and I'm going to be very personal. I have a prayer every time I go to study the Word of God, in with an intent of gleaning some doctrine, gleaning some form, and that is Holy Spirit, lead me. Let me put aside all bias. Let me put aside all conditioning, and let me put aside all heritage that I can be bathed with with the things only you can teach me. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think I think the word, first of all, you have to go to the word of God of prayer. Mm -hmm. You have to approach the word of God with humility, because if you don't approach it with humility, you will put your understanding into the word of God instead of let your understanding be formed by the word of God. And so I have to go approach it with humility um, and I have to approach it with anticipation. I have to anticipate that God will teach me something that I don't already know. Mm -hmm. You know, I, somebody told me long ago, that, you know, you don't break the scripture, the scripture breaks you. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it stuck with me. Uh, it reminded me of what you said there. Um, so how, how would you, how do you handle in your own personal study, in your own personal time, um, passages that may seem challenging or even contradictory uh, within the Bible? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to say that I don't wrestle with them. I think, you know, I've shared with people that there are some passages that, um, I mean, you know, like um, there are certain things that are are really, really unpalatable. And, um, you know, such as in Numbers 17 when, you know, um, when, uh, oh, who is the, the women of the, of the uh, the enemies of God that have laid with men, you slay them. Oh, the, and the Moabite women. The Moabite women. Yeah, I, yeah. I was I was going to say the Amalekite Moabite yeah. women. You yeah. know, and and you look at that passage, and oh, you know, and I know there's a lot of a lot of theologians that have different viewpoints on the reason of God and, and that. So I would I'm not going to say that there aren't things that I wrestle with, but here's the thing that with the difficult passages, the foolishness of God confounds the wisest of men. Right. And so um, either I say that if God is all understood, if God is all fundamentalized, if God is distilled into formula, then, then, then he is the God of my making. And so the fact that there are difficult passages, then I just go, he is God and I am not, you know, um, not that I don't, try to find understanding, not that I don't try to, to glean something, but that's part of wrestling, right? I mean, wrestling with the word of God, sometimes mm. you just got to wrestle with it. Oh. Yeah. And, and, and so yeah. and me personally, I don't, <laughs> I don't like the word contradictory for the Bible because I don't believe there's any contradictions in there. What I do believe is there are some conundrums and there's been times uh one time in particular and i always bring this up and i know walter's just about tired of it but um <laughs> when uh when um um saul <laughs> uh, um went to talk to the witch of endor right right and, you yeah. know and uh she was able to conjure up the spirit of samuel yeah i believe it was and um and you know, the Bible is clear. Don't go to these people, you know, don't, don't do this thing, you know, uh, that's witchcraft and we don't participate in that. And so because of that, I was like, there's no way that she conjured up the spirit of Sam, just absolutely right. no way. And then I, I, you know, that was something that me and Walter went back and forth with for a while. And sure. it wasn't until I talked to another older gentleman that have been in the word as well that when they came together and said this happened i had to relent and say okay but that was something that as you so eloquently put earlier was unpalatable for me but that was one of those things where you had to like you know eat that crow so yeah. you know i had my fricassee that day yeah. and uh <laughs> what i had came to understand is not contradictory but um 
a conundrum type thing. It's like God will do what he wants to do. He will use who he wants to use. He will do whatever is necessary to get the point across to humanity. And uh, that's why I I have come to the point where I'm more in the camp of conundrum than contradictory. <clears throat> yeah. Yep. And what a, go ahead. Walter. One of the, one, one of the, you know, one of the passages that comes up a lot, just if, just if we're talking about, you know, contradictory stuff is, and this is just a really basic one, but, you know, James and Paul, Paul says, you know, um, salvation by faith and faith alone. And, and James says, faith without deeds is dead. You know, that's a, that's a pretty basic one that people would say, well, you know, how are you going to unpack this? So, you know, I, my, my really the, the thought on all of this is, you know, when you get to these, you know, what's your, and you, you already answered it, you know, going into prayer, going into uh, asking, going into a humble place, contrite spirit, uh, you know, making sure that you're placing yourself in those positions to actually get an understanding instead of impressing an understanding, uh, mm -hmm. you know, is, is such a, a important part. Um, so go ahead. And, and I think, and I think just in the, in the, um, those passages that you talked about, James is, I mean, he's, who is he addressing? He's addressing mature believers. He's addressing mature Christians. Paul, for the most part, is addressing immature believers, right? He's addressing, you know, and, and so there's certain emphasis, emphases that, you know, that they place we'll on, take it. Uh, you know, <laughs> on the basis of their, of the audience too. And I think we have, to, <laughs> oh, well, Paul said this here and that, well, who's the audience and what's the purpose and, and right. what's the intent? I mean, James, James is just coming. I mean, he's coming at people, right? I mean, that I, when I preached a series uh, in James last year or two years ago, just kind of a verse by verse thing through James, I almost felt like every, every time I got up to preach, I almost felt like I had to go, all right, sorry, I'm coming at, you know, sorry that this is because James is heavy hitting, you know? And, 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 and Paul, I wonder why I like that book so much. Yeah. It yeah. makes sense to me now. Why? Yeah. I mean, Paul, Paul, not that Paul can't be, I mean, Paul has his moments too. Right. I think you've got to think like, you know, like a passage, like Hebrews six, four through six, you know, it's impossible for those who once been light and taste of the heavenly gift, the goodness of the coming gave is shared in the spirit, shared in the word, having fallen away to be brought back. What's because it says it's impossible. So, you know, if, if, if you take that in the context of, well, the backsliding, well, as soon as I backslide, well, I can't be brought back to repentance. But but what? who's the writer of Hebrews writing at? He's writing to these Jews who have become Christians, who are facing this opposition and wanting to go back. But he's encouraging them, you know, don't Jesus isn't going to die again. Don't be cut off again. You know, and I think all of that is so important that we understand. That's why that's why surround yourself right with multiple commentaries and and surround yourself with multiple people who are in the word who are led by the spirit understand it communally because the bible isn't meant to be understood communally you know it's mm -hmm. it's a it's a, it's meant to be talked about dialogically and and so i think sometimes the danger is that that we go oh well this says this here this says this here and and you know and now i'm in confusion well, let's talk about it. Let's let's let the spirit guide not just us, but others who are guided by the spirit. And let's let's understand this together. And we may have to, as as Tyreek said, we go, you know what? God is right, I'm guessing, and we'll just leave it at that, you know? So well, I tell you what, <clears throat> I'm very, very thankful that you came on tonight and that you're willing to sit here and answer all of our questions because uh, like I was telling you before the show began, it's very, very difficult to get pastors on here. And so, you know, that's to your credit that you're willing to come on here. I hope none of this felt ambushy. Um, and uh, I want to give you just a moment here to kind of tell uh, where the church is and, and anything that you want to say before we close for tonight. Yeah, um, we're a Cornerstone Christian Church. Um, we're uh, north on 267 from Brownsburg between... Uh, um, Brownsburg and um, I guess Lebanon and uh, you know we're a church where we just want to we want to we, we want to notice who you are um, be able to name you and know you as family and uh, we uphold the word of God we preach the word of God and uh, so and we don't put every verse on the screen so uh, if uh, <laughs> so bring your Bibles bring your Bibles and uh, so but but no we've uh, we're notice 
notice name and known is kind of our, um, our, we want people to notice Jesus, of course, in us, name him as Lord and savior yeah. and know him intimately as, you know, as our, our spiritual leader. So, yep. Well, thank you again for coming out and guys, uh, just, just for you heads up, those that are listening across the pond, it is in the U S it is in Indiana. Uh, and it is in the Indianapolis metropolis area, just to the west of that. So if you are in that area and you are looking for a biblical sound church, you're more than welcome to come. And I'm sure Pastor Scott would love to have you. Uh, and so uh, if you are somebody who knows a pastor who would love to come on the show, reach out to us. We'd love to have him. We'd love to talk to him. And uh, as far as that goes, guys, may the Lord bless you all. And thanks for listening. All right. See you guys. <laughs>